My name's Alan Coombe, and today I'm going to talk about natural gas contracts and prices. No one my basic primer series. So here's a picture of the map of the world with different gas prices on it. Europe, relatively high price. Japan, Korea, relatively high price. America, relatively low price. And this is a bag from um, when I first started work as a graduate trainee for a company called British Gas. You know, people prefer gas as one fuel. Well, it is one fuel in many ways, but it has its issues. So why are natural gas prices important? Well, they become a big issue, particularly in Europe, where gas prices move from being moderate to being very high. And natural gas provides most domestic heat spacing, uh, space heating in some countries. In Britain, for example, 84% of people heat their homes with natural gas. It's also a significant source of electricity generation in some countries. So again, in Britain, about 35 to 40% of electricity that's generated over a year is generated from, from gas. And natural gas is also a key product input in many industrial processes. Anything heat intensive, for example, metallurgy, uh, glass making, also petrochemicals, also fertilizer manufacturing. So natural gas prices are a big issue for an economy. So how they formed and how do they vary around the world? So let's first of all have a quick look at the gas chain. So you've got, uh, here's the upstream sector. So these are the gas producers, the people that uh, basically take the gas out of the ground via wells, process it, and then sell it onwards. Then you have the transporters, the midstream. So there's shippers, the pipeline companies, LNG shipping companies, who take it from here to the wholesalers, who import the gas into the market. They can operate, they may also operate local gas distribution. They sell it on to retailers who deal with smaller customers, the commercial and residential, or larger customers such as industrial and power. Sometimes you can have companies that do all of the above. Now, when I joined British Gas, as then was, we used to do all of the above. But as British Gas evolved into BG Group, further on in my career, we tended to focus more on the upstream, but also had a significant LNG business. We also had a pipeline business in some countries. So global gas hubs. So an actual gas hub is the location where gas is bought for trading. So hubs initially evolved where a lot of pipelines met, but later became virtual. So the classic hub, for example, is Henry Hub in Erath, Louisiana. It's the main hub for the USA and it's the benchmark of natural gas price. If you see a natural gas price, of course, in the US, uh, they will have an HH in front of it, and that's what this is. And futures contracts started trading on NYMEX in about 1990. The Waha hub in West Texas, I'll talk a little bit about later, but that's the hub of the Permian Basin. But has limited, had limited connectivity for the rest of the USA, and new pipelines are building, so the two will probably merge. Europe, you have the tidal transfer facility, TFF and the, uh, TTF in the Netherlands, which will have a subject 2003. That's the main gas benchmark for Europe. Natural balancing point, NBP is the hub of the UK and JKM is the Japan Korea market. So something posted by my uh, uh, colleague, Greg Molnar. So these are the gas prices in January 2025. So what you see here is Europe, Japan relatively high, certainly compared to America. So America is three, you know, three and a bit times cheaper than uh, the gas, price of gas in Europe. It gives obviously American industry quite a considerable advantage. Uh, some conversion factors. Um, the US tend to work some millions of British thermal units, so their prices are always MMBTUs. UK talks in therms, which is a tenth of an MMBTU, which is kind of cool, because you can understand that fairly easily. Um, mainland Europe tends to talk either in millions of uh, cubic meters or megawatt hours, okay, using these conversion factors. So if you want to have the conversion factors, please take a uh, take pause, take a snapshot of this. Russia tends to talk in cubic meters, and LNG is marketed in, in tons. So it can be a bit confusing, but uh, that's there. So global energy price and contact, put by Charles and um, uh, on the uh, 14th of February. So you have Henry Hub, national passing point in the UK. So you can see here, UK gas prices are almost four times what they are in America. Then you have uh, TTF, which is not a trans facility, and BP and TTF track each other very well. Then you have the Pan-Korea market, so that's LNG there. Then you have Brent oil and dollars per barrel, but that's uh, with its spread. And then you have coal. So again, all of them inter interact with each other. European gas prices remain elevated. So before current energy crisis, they were well, about twice what the American prices were. Then they ballooned in 2021. And then after the Russian invasion, boom, spike. Come down a bit since then, but they're still significantly elevated to what they used to be. So this is a post by Greg, um, looking at short-term and long-term factors of what drives prices. So demand, supply, other commodities, 
So please take a snapshot of this and please follow him on, on LinkedIn. He does post a lot of really valuable stuff. Uh, so please take a snapshot of this, try to get an understanding. A little bit about contract types. So what contracts have physical delivery of specified cargo, specified date, specified place. They're normally a single cargo, single chip with LNG. It's a market price set on a day can be very, very volatile. Term contracts tend to be specified for a quality of gas, specified place of a term, months or years. They can be negotiated. They are generally negotiated via gas sales agreement. They tend to have quite low volatility. They tend to be inflation linked to index oil prices, but not on a day-to-day -day indexation. And they can be either from a dedicated fuel facility, so uh, for example, from an LNG terminal, or they can be from a seller supply portfolio. So Total and Shell, for example, will sell you LNG from their portfolio. So it can be from any field within their project uh, remit. And project will have very, or life or very long term tend to be the traditional LNG situation. We had an LNG terminal, a field, and then a buy at the other end, usually in Korea or Japan, negotiated by a gas sales agreement, can be indexed to inflation or oil, but tend to have very low volatility. Pricing mechanisms, well, spot markets tend to be set by exchange, the volatile and fluctuate daily, can be indexed to a trading hub such as Henry Hub on a month forward basis, so that's a little bit less volatility can be oil indexed, just traditional long-term contracts, uh, long-term agreed base price with indexation using a price formula. They can be, traditionally had been in dollars, but sometimes they can be in euros or in UK and pounds. So take the currency risk out account for those particular markets and the European contracts and rubles or yuan because of uh, obviously the sanctions. Security demand, spot contract dependent market demand. So there's nothing security demand there, but uh, gas projects can be very expensive particularly liquefied natural gas project. We're talking hundreds of millions, billions. So you need to be in a situation where you have a long-term contract to buy that particular gas. And there could be all sorts of uh, clauses within there in terms of sell on destination flexibility, penalties for delivery, failure, force majeure, et cetera. So again, basically talk to the dedicated commercial people who understand this uh, really well. A little bit about what happened in Great Britain. So this is where I live. So I started as a graduate trainee in Britain in 1990. At the time, we were a monopoly buyer, uh, state-owned utility. We had been the state-owned utility. We were privatized in 1906, or just before I started. They tended to buy coal fields like contacts, so every gas field in the UK would sell. At that time, would sell to British Gas. They had take or pay, so the buyer takes a commercial risk. Had oil index prices. Fuel development was rationed, so it tried to depend on gas demand forecasts. And UK was a gas island with limited, some limited imports via LNG, but no interconnector pipeline. Since the 1990s, you have an open market, so multiple wholesale buyers and sellers uh, in, in retail. Uh, 2021 supplier crisis, where a few of the smaller ones went bust. Transco National Grid pipelines open to all. 1990s, DAF for gas, electrical power generation. At the time, there was a big concern with uh, the beginning of climate change concerns. Gas is about half the CO2 emissions of coal. So that was something that drove that. You have some term contracts, but many spot and very short term contracts. 2022 will be 50% spot. Hence the volatility. First and the connector built in 1998, so gas uh, is now flowing from UK to Europe and vice versa. And several new LNG terminals. LNG is now 25% UK supply, so a massive change within the time of my career. Globally, about 26% of LNG contracts are made spot, around 70% are long term. China, 22% spot, Europe, 30% spot. So these are different countries. So again, some countries are more long-term than, than others. Some have uh, some are more spot than others, depending on the maturity of the market and how much LNG plays a role in that. Shell Energy Outlook really recommend uh, looking at that. So that's the global energy trade. So now just less than three quarters long-term and now slightly over a quarter spot. Um, different types of sellers, uh, depending on long-term. So depending on signing year from where things come, so North America, Qatar, or a portfolio, for example, shall have a large LNG business. And then by indexation, whether it's indexed to Brent or prices, Henry Hub, which is gas prices, or other indexation. Moving to global market, uh, this is posted again by Greg Molnan, about 40% of gas production is exported via LNG, 17% exported via pipelines. And you have a situation where basically the Japan Korea price and TTF are merging are very close together now because LNG is the last molecule in the chain, so that's what sets the price. LNG exporters, USA, Australia, and Canada, Qatar are the biggest LNG exporters. USA has come from not very much to something very significant, likely to grow even further. 
and US exports to Asia, where they're going via pilot by canal, where they're going for Suez Canal, effectively halfway around the world. Um, I don't quite know how others, maybe by Cape Good Hope, but this gives you an idea of what's going on and significant exports to Asia as well as Europe. And gas and LNG in the US is likely growing further. So this is a map of Texas. So this is West Texas and Fermi and Bain Space Center. So that's their main gas main oil producing area, which also has a lot of associated gas. Now, this is a gas price of the Waha Hub, which is located here. Henry Hub is located just off the screen um, in Louisiana. And you can see here that gas prices went sometimes negative because there's not enough gas demand in, in West Texas. Uh, his new data centers, people doing Bitcoin mining and all sorts of other things. But having these new pipelines that are being built to the Gulf Coast here, where you've got LNG terminals, which will then take that gas into the world market. So from the EIA, the American Energy Information Agency administration, you have potentially a doubling of LNG from where we are now coming out into the future. And a lot of that gas is now going to come from the Permian. And you've now got booming gas prices, which is similar to uh, elsewhere. Meanwhile, in Europe, you have gas demand destruction. So this is a slide by Ed Conway of Sky News, uh, who's written an excellent book called The Material World. And this is looking at the uh, situation in 2021. So indigenous European production, non-Russian pipelines. So that includes Norway and Algeria, non-Russian LNG, Russian pipelines, non-Russian LNG. So Russian pipelines have now gone very to very little. Russian LNG has grown a little bit. Non-Russian LNG has increased, but that's basically just used to backfill declines in European indigenous gas production. Even Norway is beginning to turn over now. The gas is effectively being rushed by price. And you've had gas demand, demand destruction. So this is a quote. I think it might be from Seb Kennedy. I'm not entirely sure of that. Gas demand is said to be an elastic. When something is an elastic, it is brittle. Brittle things, when pushed too far, will eventually break. So is European gas demand breaking? Well, it kind of looks like it. So 18% fall in the EU27, around 17% fall in Germany, which is the industrial powerhouse of Europe, and significantly more fall in, uh, in countries in, uh, in Scandinavia and the Baltics, which are more dependent on Russian gas. Uh, Lithuania now has its own LNG import terminal, and there's some, uh, Finland has got an LNG import terminal, but it's a lot more expensive. So gas demand is breaking. And that is mainly affecting industrial customers, which are really hurting. And the general public has to pay more for the gas heating, which is hurting as well, and for the electricity. So summarize, well, like all prices, gas prices are set by supply and demand. Gas supply is a very capital intensive industry and supplies will need some demand security for investment. Traditionally, that has taken the place of long-term contracts. So if you are a uh, LNG supplier in Australia, for example, Northwest Shell, you would sign an ultra long-term contract with Japan or Korea, and you'd use that to finance your project, finance the billions that are taken for your project, and everything was good to you. Um, But it's kind of moving away from that. So you're moving from long-term contracts to a mix of long-term and spot. Okay, 25% spot, 75% long-term right now. And you're moving from gas islands. I'll give you the example of Great Britain when I first started as a graduate trainee what it is now globalized via LNG. So this is a picture from Greg Molnar posted on social media, Make Grass Great Again. So this is a picture for the Eiffel Tower. He worked for the IEA, International Energy Agency in, in Paris. And this is People Prefer Gas as Wonder Fuel, uh, posted by Jeff Thomas. Um, so this was the slogan when I was first a graduate trainee. Thank you very much. Please like, please subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one.